Okay. We will. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, Lydia seconded. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we will open up for public comment. Um, you have, uh, would you just stand and please state your name? Uh, so the Zoom folks know who you are if you're going to make a public comment tonight. And that, after that, we will hear from some of our Woodstock officials. Okay, hearing no public comment, uh, nothing up there. Thank you. Um, and so we've invited some of our uh, town and village officials to come tonight to uh, talk to us about um, further future collaboration. And so I'll let invite Eric Duffy to uh, introduce who's here tonight, and you're welcome to make any comments. Can you say here? Sure. Okay. Uh, so Eric Duffy, uh, new business manager with Stock. Yeah, I'll Susan Ford, Flatford. Uh, Susan McElroy, I'm the chair of the um, Village Trustees, and I've got two kids in the school district. Mary Riley, the right board. So I just want to speak briefly and then sure. we'll go from there. Um, so, so I want to thank the school and the, the board for having us here today. We really appreciate it. Um, and we're here today um, to publicly show our support for creating a better relationship between the municipalities and the school and the board. Um, we, sh we share the same community, we share the same tax base for the most part. Um, and so our decisions that we make individually affect the same people. Um, so I think it's important for us as a whole to understand that decisions made in this realm or in town hall, you know, go outside of, of that place as well. Um, and the more that we can collaborate, the more we can talk, the more we have an open relationship on what is happening here, what's happening on our side, um, I think the better that it is for the whole community. Um, on top of that, I think there's also a lot of opportunities to collaborate on shared services, on challenges and issues. You know, we're different boards, but we have the same issues we're facing and how we're going to work together on that um, to really help communities save some money and help us be a little more effective going forward. Um, so we want to come today and just say to everyone that we're here, we're going to do the work, uh, and we hope that we can work together going forward on, you know, not just financial issues, but all issues kind of community based as well. Um, with that said, if there are any questions or comments, we're happy to answer them as best we can. And thank you again for having us here today. Thank you for coming and reaching out. Yeah, of course. Are there any questions from... I have a question. Uh, hey, all, it's Anna. Can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. Um, I wonder what it would or how it would benefit our board to have all the town select boards uh, sort of uh, verbally um, or in person state that uh, they would support our board. Um, and if that's something that we would be interested in um, as a group moving forward, reaching out to our local officials and having them uh, attend a meeting or two and um, Kind of see what we do and maybe get them uh like the woodstock officials to verbally uh give the give us their support i think that's a great idea <laughs> awesome <laughs> thank you all and it's so great that you could be here tonight and we especially physically i know that's hard and a challenge i really appreciate that suggestions in terms of what is the best communication tool you have a board you have minutes you have lots of responsibilities how would you what would you like to see in terms of how we maintain that communication path? What would work most efficiently for you um, to kind of create that path? I think the easiest, and I'm sure like me, you don't have the time, but for me and you to have maybe a monthly meeting mm -hmm. or, or every will be the first step. Um, then I'd report back to my board, you'd report to your board. Um, would probably be the easiest things one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then how that works can always expand maybe once a year, you know, a larger meeting that will involve or something like that. But I think me and you, that first part, we need to think they're more involved. Uh, try and get, I have 10 board members, you have a lot, trying to get them all in one room together is going to be nearly impossible. Um, so that probably be my suggestion going forward. So I'll reach out and we'll set up a monthly meeting. Yeah, that's great. great. You got a quick question? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Historically, have you, do you know of, or are you aware of um, any specific, you know, projects or um, things that 
that the select board or any of the select boards and the school board have come together on? Or like, do you, I don't know what sort of historical memory you have amongst yourselves. I'm fairly new here. In, 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 my, in my three months, they have. <laughs> I can't speak beyond that. Um, but I will say that there is a work in Massachusetts, it's a different system where I'm from. Um, but where I was before, we tried very hard for the schools and town to work together on all issues. So we're able to share services with shared staff. Um, we worked together on budgets together. We presented the budget to, we call it a tribe board with the school committee, the select board, and so on. Um, I found that very helpful, even just at different perspectives. When you're talking about a budget item or expense, have other people in the room from different experience can really help, you know, fine tune your budget out of that stuff. Um, so I don't know what has happened in the past. I don't know if anyone has any uh, knowledge, but hopefully going forward, we can collaborate if need be, if need be. In the first months of COVID, there was lots of communication. We had meetings with different representative groups from out, um, from the town of Woodstock, and I was invited to participate. So it was really helpful. I think also the change came around when the Act 46 went through in the consolidation process. At town meeting, there used to be a school presentation and a select board presentation in all of the communities yeah. until that stopped happening. And so there was, there probably is much less knowledge unless you're following, you know, the select board minutes or the school board minutes or you attend these meetings. There isn't as much um, communication as there used to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob. Yeah, I, thanks very much for coming. You guys, uh, one area that I think is going to be very important to coordinate pretty closely on as time goes on is the new build. Uh, that's going to involve many issues that the town and village will need to be involved in transportation, traffic, energy, infrastructure, that kind of thing. So uh, perhaps the minutes from the working group meetings could be sent to the right people in Woodstock so that they're tuned in as we move forward on that. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. great suggestion, Bob. Yes, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, I'm just curious how it looks because as a school board, we represent several towns, uh, not specifically just Woodstock. So working with Woodstock Select Board, is that, how does that keep it, everybody like, kosher and happy when all the towns. I mean, is it going to interfere? Would it cause issues? I just don't know how it work overall the school board because we're more than just what's that. I think, well, I can say something about that because I think Anna was suggesting that perhaps we invite all the different select boards to come in maybe once, one per month or one or two times per month if they're willing to come in and talk with us. And you all know your school board members a lot better than, you know, I might from a different town. So if you want to approach that idea with them and, and uh, then, you know, I'm happy to reach out once you give me some information that, yes, they're interested. And then we can set the agenda and, and you know, sort of chart that out. Would that work for everyone? Okay. Would that work? I think they said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, I'll add something. So I chair buildings and grounds, and we have a meeting once a month, uh, two weeks from today. If if everyone attend that, you're more than welcome. But um, I'm very aware of some historical relationships, like the managing of the parking lot behind the elementary school and how that is available to the village at times. And I know we previously provided the elementary school as an emergency shelter, and I think now it's Hartford School. Um, so snow plowing, I think, was something that's come up. Uh, grounds and uh, maintenance. So if, if if everyone attends buildings and grounds, I'm I'm a chair of that committee, uh, or reach out to Sherry, and we have a grounds manager, uh, Joe Rigoli. I don't think he's here. No, he's not. Okay. He's finally taking some vacation. <laughs> Jim, I just wanted to say, uh, Jim, and I'm the director of finance. But Joe Rigoli, who is our facilities director, does work with the select boards or employees in the towns on a lot of the governmental relationships that we have around our buildings and grounds. Um, don't so often get to the town manager or to the select the elected officials, but we certainly work with the water department, the sewer department, 
the public works on projects. Um, it's it's a never ending relationship. So, um, you know, we do have relationships with all of them. Um, it would be nice to have a relationship at this level, but we do work with them with all of our community friends. I just want to make sure that people knew that. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you so much for coming and um, you can feel free to stay as long as you want. We have quite a packed agenda, <laughs> but if you feel that you need to, to move along whenever it's appropriate, don't worry about that. That's fine with us. We understand. Okay, we're gonna move into the reports now. Um, before we do that, I do wanna say that we will have an executive session this evening. Um, so please make sure that you understand that's going to happen. Um, yeah, that's it. And so we'll start with the superintendent's report. So just to start off an, an ongoing piece of information that you hear from me is our goal around 90% proficiency in reading. One of the things that we're looking at, and that's part of our professional development and literacy and mathematics, uh, the last piece we talked about is how we're reviewing our elementary school schedules. You will all have received a presentation on that during the June board meeting. The other piece that we really looked at in terms of a leadership team in order to achieve that goal is how do we use data, the information we collect on students to help teachers be best prepared for the day-to-day -day operations in the classroom. So that's the next piece of phase of our work we're looking at, and we can collect a lot of data besides the cognitive testing, you, know, you may know what's going on this week, but we do literacy testing and mathematics as well as looking at attendance level, behavior reports. And how do we connect all this body of information to what the classroom teacher is doing every day? And so we're really thinking about how do we build that infrastructure between all those numbers and what happens in a lesson plan or how a teacher works with students. So that's the next piece we're doing in terms of really making sure we get that proficiency rate. Um, another piece of work that I've been doing and I've been talking about is testifying at, um, at the in Montpelier. In the last few weeks, I've been really representing the interests of the district on both the House Human Services Committee and the House Education Committee. Um, as some of you know that we only receive partial reimbursement for our three and four year olds. We're really advocating full reimbursement for our four year olds. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to speak to both groups and talk about, again, we are one of the first districts that had full-time public pre-K for three and four-year-olds. And the impact it's had on our private early ed providers, on our students and their readiness for learning and how that's kind of playing out in the upper grades as well. So um, I know it's still being talked about. It's going between house and center right now. You know, I'm trying to be optimistic, but I think uh, when people understand the cost, because it's not only a full-time licensed teacher, but an also a trained paraeducator in order to operate our three our, our pre-K programs. Absolutely worth it seeing the, you know, the benefits in terms of our students' readiness for upper grades, addressing our special needs students' needs, um, but really helping our legislators understand what a great investment this is. Um, the central office leadership team, and some of you received some invitations that I hope you'll respond to, is to be part of our strategic plan team. So the strategic plan report that I reported on the last board meeting is going into year five, so that we're fully ready for the new strategic plan. We'll start that process this summer. That begins the middle of July with the Battelle for Kids meeting with our um, leadership team. We'll then have a visioning session on July 31st, where we look at what are the pieces of the portrait of a graduate that we think we need to attend to. And then we'll have three three-hour meetings where we actually begin to collect the idea. So how do we move forward? How do we achieve the portrait of a graduate? So we'll continue to work with Hotel for Kids. And so we now have the dates. We're inviting people to be part of it. Um, and there are about 30, 35 people who are on the actual design team and five writers. So that's how we get to that end product that I share with each of you when you first come on board. And then finally, um, I've been working on the annual administrator evaluation cycle. This is an annual process where we collect feedback from teachers and staff on how principals, directors are achieving the Vermont standards for administrators. And based on that information, as well as my observations, um, I write evaluations on every principal and every director. And that I had hoped to get out by May 1st, but got it out last week. So just want you to know that every year 
administrators receive feedback, not just from me, but also from their teachers and staff. So that's happening. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Is there any comments or questions for Sherry? Great question. Sure. Um, the, the, I'm just curious the source of the funding for the hotel for kids. I feel like I may have asked this before, but is that part of the just regular budget or is well, it really been, but I used Esther funding okay. for that one. Got so it. we were, yeah, because it, it is, it's not inexpensive, yeah. you know, in order in terms of getting all that consultation time. Right. But we were able to write into the Esther plan because it really is around setting future goals that are in line with best practices for students. And so that would be something that we revisit every five years. Do you anticipate doing the same sort of consulting? I hope so. I, uh, it's in our um, teaching and learning policy that we continue to have a strategic plan in place. I think it's healthy every time to think about who do you do that process with and how it, how it's achieved. Um, yeah. We benefit from our relationship for Battelle for Kids with other resources and other experiences. So it's been advantageous for us. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I know as a superintendent has been really helpful yeah. to kind of think about, project how we're going to get there, what are we looking for, and again, how to achieve our pressure to graduate. So it's been helpful for me. Thank you. Bob? Yes, I have a quick question on the enrollment numbers. Is there a way to add? a section of footnotes to be able to tell whether the numbers of increase or decrease uh, where they come from. I mean, for example, are any of the elementary level numbers a shift from one school to another? Um, and in terms of uh, uh, students leaving the district, are they leaving the district? Are they coming into the district? I think it'd be useful uh, to tell what these numbers mean. You know, my, three minus, minus three here, minus one there, minus five, plus five. It doesn't tell us where these students are going or coming from. Raph, do you, do you mind in one person? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, they're... Yes, we absolutely have that data and we, we, we can add those pieces in. There are lots of reasons why students leave the district. Um, so I'll have to think about how to present that, but yeah, we absolutely have that data. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else? Yes, Dad? I just wanted to recognize uh, Joyce Babbitt. Um, if getting kids excited about books um, has anything to do with reaching the 90% proficiency goal, um, she will she will be a major contributor. It's uh, book week last week. She had groups outside West dancing uh, perpetually. Yeah, it was great to mm -hmm. drop off and pick up for book week. It was really cool to see. Oh, yes, uh, Anne? Yeah, I just had a question since we were talking about the enrollment numbers. Is that attendance, because it's for a day, is it students who are enrolled or is it actually students who are attending on that day? It's enrollment. I'm not a parent. Who else? That's the most questions we've ever had on your report. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and the attack enrollment is all the great work of RAP. Okay. All right. Um, actually, RAP, you're next. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Alabama. I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation <laughs> for this race. Uh, three things I wanted to share with you tonight. So. The first was a follow up from our, our meeting um, last month where we looked at the discipline data. So I gave you a breakdown of um, between the elementary schools and the middle school, high school, in terms of the percentage of disciplinary incidents that involve uh, male students. Um, so you'll see that they're, that they're roughly equivalent. Um, but we wanted to share that with you based on our, our last conversation. Um, the second piece is also related to discipline as well. Um, so the past couple of years, um, we, we have been struggling with students vaping at the middle school, high school, and we've tried a, a number of different solutions to that problem. We tried um, a technological solution back in 2019 that really didn't work. Um, so this year, a group of us got together and we, and we tried a new technological solution, a, a different set of sensors that were much more sophisticated. Um, and then with a number of help from a lot of people and some title funding from Jen, we've purchased 12 of these sensors and have deployed them throughout the middle school, high school, and all the bathrooms. Um, and this has created quite a cultural shift for students. Um, Kobe Tancredi and, and, and Darren Snow have been very busy sort of responding to all of the 
students who, who have been vaping in these locations. And it, it's been a really valuable opportunity for, for Darren and Cody to engage students in conversations around addiction. And uh, what we're finding is that we have some students who, who really truly are addicted. And, and so this is an opportunity to connect them with new resources. Um, so that's been a new shift. And um, it's been a change um, at the middle school, high school, changing the culture around the school. Um, last piece, um, Cognia updates. Um, we are still struggling with the implementation of the statewide testing the rules. Constantly are changing the um, but our, our schools are really doing their best to um, to try to meet the needs and, and to test as best as we can. Um, but it is truly a challenging situation. So principals and teachers are very stressed right now. Um, with the state of the testing for coming. All right, are there any questions for Raf? I don't know if it's for Raf, but uh, the question going back to the um, behavior issues and the discrepancy between males and females, where are we going to go from here? Do we have, so we have the data, great, and, and what are we going to do about it? Well, that, I think that's a topic for, um, you know, if we do do a board retreat, at some point, even if it's just a half a day or a full day, um, that would be a great opportunity to learn more about that and what, what things work in addressing that. Matt? We also spent a lot of time on that last year, right out of the pandemic, the behavioral issues at the middle school, high school were a big focus of this board. This year, it seems to be the elementary schools, like it was like a lag in timing. Um, so, it may be worth just talking through after the meeting or something what we put in place last year and the new hires and um, maybe the data can even be compared year over year see if we're seeing improvement yeah, yeah i'd go one further i mean in the, i think those have been on the board for a long time have heard me say this before but anytime a piece of data comes to this board you know we're all kind of left to our own devices in terms of what to make of it matt's talking about a trend there's two other things you know is there a standard and is there a benchmark Right, like what are you need, you need some context for these numbers, or, or else we're just kind of you know going to make them what we will. And I think you know again, data the first step is awareness. They were aware. I mean, I think that's what created this when round around the data. We were able, and now that we have a finer data tool than we've ever had before, I think it really gives us an opportunity to reflect on our practices and see where our biases are. And I think that's the level we're having those conversations with the leadership team. What has this data given us that we weren't able to analyze before? And how is that impacting every day when we have interactions with students? I think that's step one is how do we change the behavior based on this new information? Because our, our data tool is not the sensitive before and we weren't able to analyze. This may have been a pattern that's been on for years, but this is the first year we've used all of and we can kind of break it out into different ways. Perhaps should we, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's right. I mean, one of the big challenges we really, really don't have a comparison from previous years because we're really this is the first year we've used this system with any kind of fidelity. So it's going to take a little bit of time to really truly really make sense and to see a trend over time. It's so, I, I see our numbers too. Is there anybody else in the state using this program that we can see what their number looks like? Just so we can have an idea. Okay, I can look and go. We have. 667 incidents, 776 incidents. What does a school of a similar size have? Are we really having an issue or are we mainstream with society? Because I think that really makes a difference. I don't think there are a few other um, districts that are using ARMA um, that we may be able to connect with. There may be, yeah, a lot of them. Um, I don't know of many that are K through 12, a lot of them are K through 8. Um, so we may, but I, I think that, that, that's a good question. You can still use any comparison of the 660, yeah. I don't know, and, yeah. and kind of rate that number. Yeah. The other thing is that, is that how committed are the schools to putting it into a data format? So if, if a school's really committed and saying, hey, we're going to just Put it all down for everything so we can see trends and patterns and see whether there's certain students rising to the top. That's what the program is for, but not every school takes it as seriously or they only record like the major things. They don't necessarily deal with all the minor things. So that's another question that would have to be known if we we're going to compare, um, you know, how much time is spent on putting that data in. Yeah, 
Well, I mean, I, I guess that would also be another good topic to know about this. Ours is bleak at ISM. It's every incident is reported in that number. What number of those reach? I, I mean, we don't have benchmarks, but what you know, what reaches level one, two, three? Yeah. And I think RAF can provide that yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it does. It does. It is a blanket. And I think that's that is an important piece that that Carrie raised about the comparisons. I mean, we're we're tracking everything. And this is the first time that we've really tracked that level of detail. Um, but that's a great question about you know how many of those are are major offenses versus you know something <clears throat> something minor that happens in the classroom. Right. Elliot? And you may have answered this, but are these unique? These are incidents. I mean, are they 10 kids doing them? Or, I mean, do we have that data? Or Yeah, we do. And I mean, it is. Maybe it's um, 10, it, but... it, there, there are, um, it depends on the, on the grade level of the band, but it's, it's like 20 to 30% of the students are, are responsible for almost all of the incidents. So, so it's, it's a group of students who are, and, and some of them are responsible for a lot of them, and some of them are responsible for a few. Marianne, I think, um, I know the system is new to us, but I think I see with, you know, like some of the social emotional curriculums that we're using and some of the school counseling stuff, um, maybe the developmental developmental curriculum they're using, this probably correlates very well with this data, but we just maybe didn't look at it like that before. Um, like I know, you know, just being from my own kids for like the second step, a lot of the stuff that they're talking about and practicing is directly related to like a lot of the behaviors. So I think we're probably doing something about it already in a really positive way. We just maybe not, maybe weren't looking at it that way. Well, that would definitely be, I think, a good topic for us to consider as we would either at a regular board meeting to have a more in-depth presentation of what are the kinds of things going on or have it as a separate meeting. So if the board is interested in that, we can work on getting that scheduled. It will be no, nice to get through the end of the year and, and then be able to see monthly whether there are trends in the months. Um, and then maybe in the fall, we can do a more intensive um, look at what is going on and see how it, there's improvements from September to June or it's going downhill. There's so many ways of looking at it. Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, I loved what uh, Superintendent Sousa said around digging into biases, because uh, from my own research, I know that our school system, not WCSU, but school systems in general, um, both in the United States and internationally, are um, biased towards female students and biased against male students. And this rate of uh, male disciplinary incidences is, is certainly not unique to our school district. Uh, males tend to uh, really, mm, the frequency of male incidences usually out far, far outweigh the females. Um, and I have a couple of ideas that I would love to discuss, not now, but when we have the discussion about how we might do better for our male students moving forward. And I think all the social emotional work is is on point. That's exactly where we need to go. And I think we'll see that in in rates as we move forward and continue collecting the data. Thank you, Anna. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Ralph, for all that work. Um, we and now Shana will present from as the director of student support services. Hi, I'm Shana Kalinsky, and I'm the Director of Student Support Services, and I'd like to highlight, in addition to my bullets in the report, some of the work of the folks out in the district working directly with students. And the first is our nursing team, who pulled off the Herculean effort of having our first health and wellness fair that we held in the rank uh, two weeks ago. They had approximately 30 community partners that included mental health, hospice, medical organizations, including Dartmouth and Agatici, martial arts, community safety and emergency groups. Visit was there with the smoothie bike, where people could make a smoothie while riding the bike. There were parent groups, and our own students were there volunteering in various ways and painting the faces of participants in the health and wellness fair. The nurses also had prizes and giveaways that they gave away all day long, including Fitbits and exercise by gym memberships, sports and fitness equipment, books, toys, and they had bike helmets for children of all ages that they gave away during the course of the day. 
and they had ultrasonic toothbrushes, which were a big hit with the raffles. So I wanted to make sure to highlight the amount of work and effort that, that they put into this community-wide event. So it supported our students and their families. I'll also tag on to what Raf said about Cognia, because talk about Herculean efforts. Raf, Audrey Richardson, and the test uh, team of test administrators have had a really complex undertaking. So imagine being an educator and waiting for guidance on this big state assessment, administration guides, accommodation information. Accommodation is something that allows students who might have a particular disability to access the test in a way that gives them the capability to participate and when they might otherwise not. So information about practice tests, all of these things were grossly delayed, non-functional, uh, and never arrived at all in some cases. Now imagine being a student taking that high stakes, stakes assessment and you and your teacher have never seen it. You've never gotten to test out, hey, where's the calculator? Where is the part where I take my notes to type in my answer? Now being a student, imagine being a student with a learning disability and the accommodations that your teacher and your special education department and RAV have asked the state to provide for you isn't there or it was changed or taken away and you didn't find out until you started the test that very day. So Raf and Audrey, and again, the testing administrators across the district have been on call every minute as teachers discovered these things while their students were testing. They provided ongoing support to the teachers and everyone in the building so that the tests can be taken by the students in the most positive and flexible way possible, but it has been extremely challenging um, but we've had some amazing uh, work in partnership to support our students across the district. Uh, and in also light of supporting our students, Devin Workman, uh, one of our special educators, just returned from something called CPI training. The name sounds a, a little intense. It's called Cr Crisis Prevention and Intervention. And what it is, it's a set of strategies and methodologies for educators and many other uh, professions to be used to help calm down the situation. And it works very well with our second step social emotional curriculum and some of the behavioral challenges that we've had in our schools. So having Devin be trained in this as a facilitator will not only benefit all of the teachers that he can train across the district, but it will help provide more support to students in all grades across all buildings in the district. Thank you, Shana. Is there any questions for Shana? I have just a, a comment. I attended the, the health and wellness fair with two of my kids and we had an awesome time. Yes, it was so a lot of fun. All right, I think then we can now move to the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Hi everyone, Jen Staten, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. I'd like to speak to two pieces tonight really quickly. Uh, first, I wanted to say that this Wednesday is our last Late Start Wednesday, and teachers are going to do a jigsaw and learn from one another in, because they've been in groups on special topics throughout the year. They're actually going to come together and learn from one another. Um, I did want to say a thank you to the school board and to families for supporting this work. There's been some incredible PD happening, and we know that is a little bit of a burden on those Wednesdays mornings, um, but it's been well worth it, so thank you. I also wanted to speak to one more form of testing that's happening this month, and that's AP testing. AP testing started this week, and we have over well, around 274 tests happening, AP tests specifically. What's really great about these tests is that, thanks to the school board, uh, the one test per student is actually funded. And at $97 a piece, and some students taking five or more AP tests, that can add up. So that is a wonderful benefit and thanks to the school board for supporting um, the AP program. And though we've talked a lot about testing, um, I did wanna say a shout out to Gabriella Durgain for organizing the AP testing. It's another large task when it comes to end of year testing. Um, but beyond testing, there are still some great learning experiences happening um, throughout the year. And you're gonna hear about two of them tonight. One is the craft program, um, they're here to present. And then you're also gonna hear from our modern and classical languages program about some virtual exchanges. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jen. Are there any questions or comments for Jen? All right, and we have a student report or two students reporting. We're just going this year tonight. We have one. Um, 
Hi, guys. Uh, AP tests began this week. Busy time for students generally. Um, spring sports season is, is well underway, as Aiden knows too well. He's been schlepped down to Manchester for a lacrosse game tonight, so um, I have to cover his, his role here. But um, uh, I think in terms of what's going on with the news, we've had some groups of students meeting with the Dartmouth seniors that have been circulating uh, our district this year. So I know they met with some sophomores and some freshmen so far. So they've been pretty cool to meet with. Um, that group will also be at our social action club meeting on Thursday. So we'll be talking about um, our upcoming student leadership summit, defining our focus for that. Uh, I've been working on securing grant funding for that as well. Um, so things are looking up on that front. Um, we've also been kind of making more solid our approach for the WASP conversation, potentially changing our mascot at the high school, middle school uh, is a big task. Uh, so that's been in the hands of some teachers and some students. Uh, and I think the Social Action Club has an idea of how they want to approach that with regards to advisory. Um, not super across that, but that's my understanding of it. Um, I think we've been working on our upcoming presentation to the Vermont Superintendents Association. Mm -hmm. so we'll be meeting on Friday for that. And uh, I think that's about all I've got right now, but there's a lot going on. Thank you very much, Owen. Any questions or comments for Owen? All right, uh, that concludes the reports and now we will be moving into the presentations. And uh, Colleen O'Connell is going to start with a presentation about international virtual exchange. Hi, my name is Colleen O'Connell and I'm trying to figure out if I've been teaching for 20 or 21 years. So that's a good thing because I still like it and I haven't I haven't uh, been thinking about how many years it has been. It actually feels like the bottom. Um, probably about, um, maybe about 15 years ago, we started, there's always been programs to take students abroad and on service trips. And um, about 15 years ago, we started a, a real exchange program. And the exchange program, we had a school in France and we had a school in Spain. And uh, the students went there every other year. And um, they, uh, because of COVID, we sort of had to suspend that. Um, we had a lot of students involved in that. We were just in the, in the throes of resurrecting it. And um, we we're also looking for opportunities for students to get involved in exchanges of all kinds. And we thought that it might be a good idea to begin thinking about virtual exchanges because sometimes students can't go away, don't want to go away, maybe they don't want to host. Um, also, we, our exchanges are really sent, focused in Europe, so it's France and Spain, because of those are the two languages that are taught here, it makes the most sense. But um, we thought it would be a really good idea for students to sort of get, be exposed to and meet other students in um, what we call the MENA region, and that would be the Middle East and North Africa. And um, it was really became the focus because I was looking for a so an NGO that would be able that would be able to provide a good template for this sort of exchange, something that would be serious exchange. We could sustain it. It would be well supported, um, and there would be it would be we we talk about data, but this uh, particular NGO I'm going to tell you about does a lot with data to see whether or not these, how effective these exchanges are. MENA region, because a lot of the support comes from this, uh, something called the Stevens Initiative, named for Chris Stevens, who was the, um, he was the ambassador who was killed in Benghazi, and he was really interested in students, young students learning about each other, learning about, um, predominantly Muslim countries learning about Western and Western countries, and Western students learning about uh, MENA. So the, I was looking about two years ago, I started to look researching um, organizations that might be able to help us with this endeavor. 
and I came upon a, a, something that was like a really good program, and the program is called SOLIA, and they are an international uh, program, and they work exclusively with university students, and what they do is they um, have universities throughout the world, and they set up the virtual exchanges with right. the students. They don't work, or they didn't work with high school students. But I read extensively um, about their mission, about how they set up the programs, how they sustain it, and their goals. And basically, what they believe, I mean, they, you, you, I can um, forward you their, um, their website, but basically, they believe that it's funny because you were talking about communication here, communication from different agents. And their whole idea is that if we get better at communicating, if we learn how to communicate, but more importantly, if we learn how to listen to one another, and if we teach students how to listen to one another, then perhaps some of these barriers that exist, um, it will help bring down some of these barriers. So I have to look at my notes now because I could probably wax forever on this. Um, so two years ago, we started, and um, what we did was I took the nucleus of French speaking students. And so the, the exchange was done ex exclusively in French. There were a few reasons for that. Number one, it put the students in the position of being uh, communicating in not their first language. So that was a whole experience unto themselves. They had to learn to adapt. They had to learn to be good listeners. They had to learn um, to be able to ask questions and admit when they didn't know things. So we had four sessions, and the way it's set up is um, we had a school in Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon. There were 10 students. We had a school in Tunisia, Tunis, Tunisia, 10 students. We had our 10 students. And each, each group of, uh, it's 30 students in all, and each group of 10 had three facilitators, one who spoke English, one who spoke French, and one who spoke Arabic. Behind this whole thing, they have a complete tech, tech center. So if anything goes down with one of the kids, you know, something happens and they lose power or what, whatever could happen, their tech helps us um, take care of all those problems. The curriculum is written by Solia with collaboration with us. And so this year, I, was, um, I, I didn't pull up what last year's curriculum was, but this year, the topics were contemporary culture, what series might you watch, what um, movies do you watch, what mu music do you listen to. We, they talked about women's identity and rights because uh, the meeting we had coincided with the International Day of Women. We talked about Ramadan because we, uh, we had another, the, the next session was at the start of Ramadan. And then the last one was about identity, multiple identities, and the concept of freedom and equality. The kids meet um, in school. In fact, we've, we were able to use two delay days because we also have to consider time differences. Tunisia doesn't change their clocks. Beirut does, and we do. So we had to coordinate that. And so the delay days worked really well for that. And they meet for an hour and a half and they're prepped. So for example, I, I have the curriculum or I collaborate with the curriculum with a man named Raphael Tislet and he lives in Paris. And so we work on the curriculum together. And then what we do is I prep my students and they prep their students just so that we can get past a little bit of the language barrier. For this round this year, we did two in English and two in French so that it would be fair to the two to the Asians. Um, we want the we really want to extend this and I've been working with Solia to talk about what what are ways in which we can include more students in this. I think we'll always have a nucleus of language speakers. That would be a really good thing for the uh, kids to do. Um, they use their language in real life situations, but also there are a lot of kids that are interested in these kind of topics, and we could introduce that to them. So I talked with um, Marie Anderson and Sumant about maybe having the Social Action Club become a part of this, and they can also uh, contribute to this or become part of the exchange. I'm a facilitator now with Solia, 
So the thing is, we would like to stay with Solia because you they're all we're all trained facilitators. And to do that, we have to do some fundraising. We've been able to um we've been able to sustain it for the last two years, but we're gonna find a way, a mechanism to keep it going and be involved in this group. We are their only the only high school client they have. So and and it really took a lot to convince them that seniors were just the right people for this. They're they're in transition between being in high school. They have a lot of context. They learn a lot of these kinds of things. They talk a lot about social issues and social justice. But we, instead of just keeping it local, we're trying to say, look, you know what? Some of the issues we face here are some of the issues the kids in Tunisia face. Some of the kids in in Lebanon face. Some of the dreams you have here are, are the very same dreams that they have, and so it, I just think it helps them to to see things in a in a greater you know sort of word a global way, as per our uh, portrait of graduate that says locally inspired, globally prepared, and we can and we have been looking at assessments because if you take if you major in global affairs or global studies in a university you will have to take an assessment. So there are assessments available to us and we've been talking to Solia about that because that might be a really nice thing for our students to have the experience of having taken an assessment before they go to college or before they begin this. So I just quickly, um, I think the last thing I wanted to say was that um, I thought that the, I wrote down, we had, um, the, the CEO was Solia wrote me a letter of recommendation because I tried to get a grant to so that we could put some more funds into it and a little bit more time. But she had remembered I had said that the goal was to create different opportunities to students uh, for students to become globally competent, but really to be more empathetic to others. And I had taught, spoke to her about this, and I firmly believe this that. If students have constructive and open dialogue with cohorts in other countries, as they do here, they have conversations with their with their peers, the better they'll be able to understand their place. And maybe if they see these things, um, if they see things that happening in their country, I mean, uh, in, in someone else's country, maybe they will become more objective and become more active about what they can do to change things for the better or for their lives or become interested, even, even just basically become interested in another person. So that's the uh, virtual exchange as it stands. And I just wanted to let you know what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. Does anyone have a question for Colleen? Uh, I quick question. Oh, go ahead. How old are the kids in, in Tunisia and Lebanon? You said we're the only um, high school client? Well, with the art group, the Lebanon. Oh, they're all high school. They're all high school. Yeah. What is the cost? Um, it's six thousand a year for ten students. Yes. Basically. Yeah. Well, it's, it really is thirty students, but and then we and then what we did this year because we really do need to. It's it's a big investment, and it doesn't seem like it really meets everyone in the school, or it doesn't give the same opportunity to everyone. So I had the students this year go into the advisory for uh, juniors and seniors, and they presented, they did a presentation and we put together YouTube so that to invite other students to become involved in the program. What I was saying, like either it would be through advisory or else it would be through the social action. You probably wouldn't want, you would probably want your target to be um juniors and seniors yeah. um probably younger than that they probably i'm not sure it would have the same effects but definitely with you um juniors and seniors but we are we have to think very carefully about that because we want to include more students if you open up the prezi um in the uh packet you can see a student who spoke about what she got took away from mm -hmm. The program. So when you have a chance to look at that, that's a nice little video. Well, thank you very much, Colleen. You're welcome. And we have a second presentation on the PRAS program with Kat Robbins, Janice Fogel, and Addie Castriato. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kat Robbins, and I'm the place-based learning coordinator um, in partnership with Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park. Um, and I have um, Janice and Abby here as well, and then two students, Alex and um, Chelsea, who are going to talk in just a minute as well. We're here to talk to you about the CRAFT program, which stands for Community and Climate Resilience through Agriculture, Forestry, and Technology. And I think it's such a great complement of programs to the international work that Colleen and her colleagues have been doing, um, focusing on the global scale, and we're focusing on the local scale. And I'm so happy that we have these complementary programs at our school for our students. Um, CRAFT is a pathway of courses and experiences that students can engage in at high school to take a deep dive into their community and taking action and developing hope around climate issues, around community issues. And um, we have, we just launched CRAFT in the fall. And so we thought we would come back to you this spring and give you a little update on how it's going. Um, I am gonna attempt to share my screen, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I that looks like it's been disabled for me. Yeah. There you go. Raina just attached okay. it. You're all set now. Let's try again. Um, okay, hold on one sec. Um oh. let's see. I know you're looking at the board agenda. Here we go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with just a little bit of an overview about what CRAFT is, and then I'm going to let our students speak about their experience. Um, so we launched with 16 students who have enrolled in CRAFT who are working towards um, earning this credential on their transcript. Um, we're graduating two students this year, Hudson Maxim and Holden Larmy. Uh, we primarily focused our efforts on ninth graders because they would have the most opportunity to fully engage with CRAFT, but we had a couple of seniors who wanted in and they could um, transform their schedule this year and grandfather in some of the requirements so that they could obtain this credential. So we're pretty proud of them. Um, we've been hosting our craft teachers, a dozen of them, um, every month during our late start professional development sessions. And they've um, reported feeling energized and hopeful about the work that they're doing. And they unanimously agreed that they wanted to continue this work again next year. Um, we've hosted two student retreats and we have another one on the books for all students enrolled in craft. They don't travel as a cohort through their classes um, because they have a lot of choice in the classes they engage in and when they engage in them. And so we try to pull them together multiple times a year to form um, a sense of community and for them to share their reflections about what they're learning. Um, we've taken all those field trips and probably more that are listed on this slide, and we've hosted three career panels um, with different themes with members of our community who have talked about their careers and their education path and given advice to our current students. We've had students testify to the House Ag and Natural Resource Committee on the importance of universal school meals, as well as um, this type of agriculture education. And we also have two students who are co-planning and facilitating a statewide youth-led farm to school conference. So these are just some highlights um, of what our program has, has been able to help make happen this year. Um, and then next, um, I wanted to turn this over to Alex and Chelsea. Um, hopefully they don't mind these photos of them I'm in here <laughs> to uh, share a little bit about their experience. Um, Alex, would you like to go first? Yes, I would love to. Um, should I just begin on talking about why I'm doing craft? That would be great. Okay, um, I'm doing craft because I believe it is so important um, as being like the next generation to lead our country and to lead our world. It's important to advocate for the environment and the health of the environment because um, the world is in our hands. And if we don't do something about it, it's not gonna be great for us. And our environment is so important. Um, I also am doing craft because it teaches a lot of important life skills, such as leadership, flexibility, adaptation, responsibility, and so much more through all these projects. We get to be doing field trips when I get to work with other students on solutions to um, world climate problems, climate change, um, and even 
stuff like just simply in our greenhouse when we work, um, this is something that Chelsea mentioned earlier, I don't wanna take credit for it. When we work towards um, trying to make pollinator gardens that um, like where plants, they work together to make this like permaculture. They work together to make um, like a little environment, a little ecosystem. Like I've learned so much and it, it's very important because um, I know these are things that I'm going to take with me throughout the rest of my high school career, college career, and into my careers in the future. Thank you, Alex. Is there one particular um, craft experience that you had this year that stands out in your mind? Yeah, I've actually had multiple. Um, I think my favorite part was the panel on agriculture and environmental policy. Um, because I would love to work, like, I'd love to work on that. I'd love to, um, say, go to law school and work on um, policies around agriculture and our environment. Um, it was just very interesting to learn from a bunch of people who are very experienced in that, uh, in that field. And of course, the other ones were very interesting. I really enjoyed the farmers one and the first one we had. Um, something that we did as a ninth grade was the Three Squares Vermont project. It wasn't based off, off of craft. It was kind of an idea from it, but it wasn't based simply on craft. Um, it was where we went to the store um, and we went to Hanover's and we, I'm so sorry, we, uh, we made, We were shopping on the Three Squares Vermont food budget for one person for a week, and it was so eye-opening. I really learned a lot from it. It really taught me a lot about food deserts and um, rural homelessness within our um, within our state and how much of an issue it is. Um, yeah, I think, that, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, Chelsea, would you like to share your reasons for being a part of CRAFT? Yep. Um, so should I just do the same? Yes. So, just so, okay. So, um, just a quick background. I, I've been in the school district for, I don't know, since like s second grade. And I've always been really surrounded by like agricultural aspects just in my life, just growing up on farms and doing farm work. So, when I got to middle school and heard about an opportunity like this, I was really excited. And then going into high school and this year, um, learning more about craft and some of the opportunities that it gives you as a student, um, especially as a ninth grade student, kind of very young in the high school career. Uh, just having these opportunities that craft can give you was really um, vital for me. and. For a lot of students also because living in Vermont it's such a place where you're surrounded by farms and just a lot of agricultural based careers and job paths and a lot of people after high school will get an education and go further in a career like that so having a, a path like craft that can lead you further and give you more opportunities for further education after college and just something that or after anything you want to do after high school is really important to me and to a lot of other students like Alex and other ones other students that are in this prog program and just like in the past few months doing some of the opportunities like the retreats um, were really important to me and were kind of a celebration of the fact that of how much work we put in just doing just little things going to class every, th every day and doing greenhouse jobs and helping to put together um, like you might have known about the greenhouse sale we have right now we're selling plants that we grew over the winter in our greenhouse and we're learning about um, what is in that soil and the nutrients and the parts of the plant and everything about the plant. And then after that, it takes more steps to eventually 
affect our community and we get to sell the plants or um, donate them to the town their flower boxes and everything has a connection and you can really see it when you're in this program and it's something that you wouldn't be able to see if if you weren't if you weren't in the craft program as much as if you were it's all a connection connection it's a good theme thank you and the photo of Chelsea on here is from her um, innovation class where students in her class went to the National Park to learn about some monitoring challenges that our inventory and monitoring department were having. And the students tried to come up with solutions to help them monitor things in the field like stream flow or bird song. And so they presented some eco droid solutions to the National Park staff, which was really awesome. Um, so I'm not going to um, like go into much detail on the next couple of slides because I know you all have a crazy packed agenda <laughs> for tonight. Um, so I'll just let you know that these are linked and these are just some examples from some of the other craft classes of the way that craft is influencing how students are learning um, in wellness, um, in our AP statistics class. Um, in our brand new eco art class. You may see some of the installations around campus. Um, but I did want um, Abby and Janice to have a couple of minutes just to talk about some pretty amazing changes that have been made in the greenhouse and gardens this year. Awesome, thank you. Um, Abby, how about I do the first half and you could do the second half? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and this, you know, I, I really wanna give a, and a tremendous shout out to our students who were willing to to step up to speak about their experiences and craft. It's it's so valuable. We're always trying to make sure that part of this program is that the students have a voice, and um, we're trying to give them many opportunities for that. So when they take those opportunities, it feels like a really great um, uh, part of the program. And I also want to just say that Abby, who has joined us this year as our garden and greenhouse manager, has done more than I could have ever expected um, in helping to create a program that really is working towards stewardship and sustainability and systems thinking and service learning. Like we're, those are the tenets of what we hold um, valuable in craft. And so these are the things that we kind of identified um, and have now posted in the greenhouse to show that we are really improving our um, the way that we use our resources and and what resources we choose to to put out into our community. So we've reused a tremendous amount of pots, so reducing the amount of plastic that we're using. Um, we are now we have a really high functioning uh, composting system, so we're creating our own soil and kids are composting in classrooms, which has um, been really great. We started using Vermont compost as, as our soil and it's been so incredible because it's a local company and our plants are just growing beautifully. Um, and we grew 350 pounds of our own produce this year. And, um, Alex and, and Chelsea were a part of creating a, a CSA share of microgreens that we did throughout the year. Um, and we did 425 shares of microgreens that um, the students were completely responsible for so people could have fresh greens in the winter. Yeah, so we're also um, starting to grow, or last year we grew traditional varieties of corn and beans for the Abenaki Land Link project, and this coming year we'll be growing corn, beans, and squash for the project, and also acting as like a regional um, site for people to bring their produce that they're growing for this project that we can cure um, and store in our greenhouses. Um, we're growing a lot more native plants in the spring sale, um, and a lot of these students have collected the seeds from um, around campus and then saved and cold stratified over the winter, um, and now we're selling them in the spring sale. Um, we use cover crops and no-till methods in our school garden um, to reduce erosion um, and make sure that the soil biome is nice and healthy, because in one handful of soil, there's 
as many microbes as humans that have ever lived on earth, which is pretty crazy. Um, and then we also heated the big greenhouse for nine fewer weeks and didn't heat the little greenhouse at all until the last couple of weeks to reduce our emissions. Um, and as Janice mentioned, really, we're just trying to align um, the greenhouse with our um, mission of craft and that sustainability um, and stewardship focus. So really trying to gear everything we do in the greenhouse towards um, sustainability and also um, so that the students can learn as much from every action that we take as possible. So really being mindful in what we're choosing to do um, and grow in our gardens and greenhouses. Yeah, and then, been uh, I was just, I was just going to say a quick addition to that is that the, there are students in art who are going to be making panels to put onto the actual school building to highlight these sustainable practices. And I just want to say, Abby has been such a phenomenal addition to the craft team this year. Um, everything that she has done to help us really walk the talk has has been so amazing. And I can't imagine the program being where it is without her. Um, I also just wanted to share and highlight this is a value that students um, voted on and agreed on as one of the most important things that we need to keep in mind when we're developing um, craft classes and craft learning activities. Um, and for the future. So this has all just been this past year. And so I wanted to give you a little glimpse into the future. We're enrolling at least an additional 14 students. So I imagine if we add about 15 students every year, by the time we're like fully up and running, we've, we've introduced four new grades. Maybe we'll have about 60 students school-wide involved in craft. Um, we're adding three new craft classes that will count towards the student's progress towards a credential, economics and the environment, data science, and Spanish three. Um, some of you may remember that part of our original vision for craft was launching an immersive semester, and that actually dovetails with our uh, district strategic plan as well. We're still working towards that vision, and we hope to launch an immersive semester for students in the fall of 2024, which means they could spend um, maybe half of their day every day um, taking a real deep dive into learning on the land in a, in a smaller community. Um, and so we will we'll, we'll come back to you all next year with some ideas for um, adjusting staffing positions, um, potentially adding one new teaching position to support this immersive semester idea. So that's a little glimpse into the future. Um, we thank you for your time. And I don't, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll stop sharing and let Carrie take over again. Can I just add, can I add one more quick comment? I just happened to talk to Julie Brown in the um, the office the other day. Hadn't seen her in months, you know, work in the same building. And uh, she said, oh, my God, the most amazing thing. I was talking to my neighbor and we live in Weathersfield. And she said how her, um, you know, her child was going to go to Woodstock because of craft, that they were so impressed by the innovation behind craft that they felt like they had to choose Woodstock because Woodstock would support a program like this. And, you know, that's just one comment. There's There's been lots of others, but that really stood out to me. And Julie was really so kind about sharing that. And um, it's good to know that there's actually another student visiting who's really interested in, the, in this program as well. So we're hoping too, that this is not just like for the students who are already there, but the students might want to come to us because of craft. All right, thank you very much, craft team. Does, do, uh, does the board have any questions or comments they'd like to make? I'll make a quick comment. My daughter, Eleanor, is in the craft program in ninth grade and she loves it. And one thing that wasn't mentioned, I don't think, is how much she enjoys the food that they make, <laughs> the stuff that they grow. We try to have food at every teacher meeting. Maybe that's why they want to come back next year. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, the depth of the, the, the thinking that goes into this program. Thank you. All right. Now we have Jim Fenn presenting to us about the audit.
Um, we have our fiscal year 22, so the year that ended 10 months ago, audits are finally here. And I wanted to uh, give you the overview of what the audits are. The first thing I wanted to do is show you how to find the audits on our website. This is our website. If you go to about Windsor Central, go to district financials. There's a tab right here that says audits. You open that tab and in that tab is four folders. So this will be your 19, 20, 21 and 22. And in each one of those is the WCSU. If you go back out to the full audit, there's Pittsfield, WCSU, and, and Woodstock um, Unified. So all of the audits the last four years are on the website. Um, I'm more than happy to print hard copies, but they're about 100 pages each. And um, I'd much rather you go here. Um, Tonight, what I'd like to do is give you a quick overview of our audits. Um, uh, in the board package, or link to the board package, is my uh, brief presentation. But what's important to note is and I'm going to fly through these audits and I really just want to show you some of the highlights of what's what's in here. So the first thing and I think the most important thing is the independent auditors um, report and their opinion. And in their opinion, um, our numbers fairly represent what we did. And that's the most important part of the whole audit, in my opinion, is if they think we did a good job, they say that here. Um, if you go to the management letter, and the management letter is online, um, during their uh, audit, they became aware of several uh, matters. They referred to us as uh, in management comments. The three things that they, they uh, talk to us about where time sheets and time documents. This has been a struggle in this district. July 1st of this year, we implemented full time sheets for anybody who's hourly and anybody who's grant funded. Uh, the finding a year ago was we didn't do proper grant time sheet studies on people in our ESSER and COVID relief funds. We've been doing it properly in all of our other grants for many years. We dropped the ball on the COVID and the ESSER funds, and they, they found that they had a finding on it. We've since corrected that. The next one is that we're not following our district purchase order policy. We're not. End of conversation. Effective July 1st, nothing will get paid, nothing will get processed without a purchase order because we have a new software. We've trained most of the secretaries and the districts and the principals, not all of them yet, but most of them in doing their own purchase orders, approving them, and they can't do a purchase order if there's not money in the line. So our controls are in place, the systems are there, and we're moving forward with that. The third uh, finding was um, a finding about outstanding checks. Um, we have a tendency to carry outstanding checks for years. Um, we've implemented a process for now when a check is more than 90 days old, we call the person who we sent the money to and say, hey, you're going to cash the check. Did you get it? Did you lose it? Do you want us to replace it? Um, or if they say, gee, now we're just, we don't care. So we'll quit. And so we've implemented processes. Uh, we're small enough, and the half dozen or so that we have, it's easy enough to make those phone calls. So we're trying to be proactive and address those concerns. Okay. As we zip through this, one of the first things I want to do is take you to the notes. And the, the notes, um, the first note I want to talk about is note 22, which is on page 65 of the audit. Every year when the auditors come in, we sit with them, we go through all the things that happen during the year, 
And one of the things that frequently happens is we discover that something we reported last year isn't quite the way it should have been. And they do a restatement. Uh, we've done several restatements as a result of the merger and bringing all of our districts together and straightening out all the things we brought together. And it's been a long process. Um, so we did a major restatement, at, you know, at the end of um, 22 of the FY21 audit to probably address some things that probably didn't get carried over correctly or uh, didn't get addressed over the first few years of our emerge this year. Um, nothing, nothing terribly earth shattering, but it was a restatement. The next thing I want to talk about is subsequent events. Uh, one of the things we always have to talk about with the auditors is subsequent events. What did we do after the close of the fiscal year that impacts anybody who reads our financial statements? So the subsequent event of note was that we borrowed $3.2 million the day after the fiscal year closed. We did that as our tax anticipation note, which we do July 1st of every year, but it's a, sub, it's a subsequent event that impacts um, or that any reader of our financial statement should be aware of. The next thing that we need to look at is um, our budget to actual. How is our spending in comparison to uh, the actual budget? And the first page we're looking at here is revenues. And our revenues exceeded by the budget by $77,000. So that was pretty close. Where we weren't terribly close, was on our spending, where we had several positions that were in the prior year that didn't get funded in this year, in fiscal year 22. And so we overspent on the fiscal year 22 budget. By over a million dollars. Now, 392,000 of that had to do with buildings and grounds. 350,000 of that had to do with reopening uh, Prosper Valley. Um, a lot of the building grounds had to do with the band-aids we keep buying to keep the game system next door running. So these were facilities issues that uh, we kept running into. But we overspent the budget by a million dollars in FY22. And so that could be concerning. It should be concerning. Um, so let's go on and see what that did to us. And our balance sheet, which is statement C, which is on page 20 of our audit, it shows that we now have an unassigned fund balance of negative $560,000 in the district. Uh, overall, we still have $2.6 million fund balance, but in our general fund, we have an unassigned negative fund fund balance of $560,000. So this is something over time we're gonna to have to make up. Okay, when you go to your change in that position, our net position has only dropped about $600,000. That's not a terrible drop. It's still a substantial net position. We're in good shape there. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, on a fund balance, we have five different types of fund balance. We have the non-spendable, which is non-cash ass assets that we can't spend. Typically it's inventory or prepaid expenses. We have restricted, which are legally restricted, such as our grants or food service program. We have committed funds, funds which are restricted for a specific use um, and require a vote for the legislative body to spend. A restricted fund would be a capital reserve fund. Um, assigned are monies that we've assigned because we have um, encumbrance, a purchase order, something else where we plan on spending it, and unassigned is the money that's not committed to anything else. So when we got to our financial analysis of the district, again, here's our fund balances. 
And our unassigned went from a positive 542,000 to a negative 560,000. So that was that million dollars of what we're spending because we only had $77,000 of revenue in excess of our budget. The next couple of pages here are the all of the other nine major funds that we carry at the district. And uh, those include our Act 2230 grant, our private grants, um, our capital reserve, not capital reserve, um, yeah, capital reserve funds, uh, some of the ESSER funds and some of the other funds that are considered non-major. Uh, we also had our after school program, um, student activities, elementary and high school. Okay. Uh, non-current uh, general obligations. For our non-current general obligations, we went from three hundred thirty-three thousand dollars at the end of fiscal year twenty-one to three million two hundred sixty-nine thousand three hundred twenty-one dollars at the end of fiscal year twenty-two. So, what's that made up of? That's made up of two hundred sixty-six thousand dollars, which is the remaining balance of the bond. For the high school renovations from 2015, I believe, and a little over three million dollars for the JCI Energy Conservation Project that the board agreed uh, approved last year, which is a 15-year um, capital lease. So those are the those are the two things that changed our long-term um, obligations. Compensated absences. Compensated absences are accrued leaves that our employees have earned that we have to recognize because they're due and payable. And if they were to leave tomorrow, we'd have to pay those out. Uh, Beamer's pension liability, I'll get into that in a minute because I have a little bit more information on that that I'll share. Okay. So our capital assets, our capital assets actually grew by a little over a million and a half dollars last year. And so where did the, where was, did the growth take place? Well, it was really in the improvements you've made to the buildings. So the funding that we borrowed to improve the buildings, it shows up here because we've now recognized them as part of our capital assets for our district. Okay. One of the things that we do is we break down what's our short-term debt, which is our tax anticipation note, and our long-term debt. Here are our two long-term loans. Again, the high school bond, which we're paying $66,667 a year on, and then the 15-year um, lease purchase on the energy conservation. Here is the debt schedule over the next five years of how we're paying those debts. So we're paying $66,667 of principal on the bond, $174,645,000 of principal on the lease, total of 312. The payments stay fairly level every year for the next five years, and then the high school drops off and it drops down to just the the uh, energy conservation project. We do have two other liabilities that are listed on our uh, balance sheet. One of them is the Vistas uh, plan. Vistas is Mont uh, School Teachers Retirement System. And we generally don't pay anything to that. Like generally, we do pay 22% towards the retirement system for any teacher that is grant funded because the state only pays for teachers that are locally funded. And we do pay $1,408 this year, and it's going up a little bit next year for every teacher hired after a certain date 
towards their health insurance benefit um, as a retiree. Um, that pension is in the hole by a few million, a few billion dollars. And the portion of that, or the portion of that that's assigned to Windsor Central is $17,703,000. Uh, what does that mean to us? It's a reporting requirement. That's all it means. If we were to close our school tomorrow, we would not have to pay that money. But that's the obligation assigned to us as our proportion of the total picture for the teachers that are members of that retirement system. So it's truly a reporting um, requirement. The other uh, retirement system we participate in is Beamers, which is a Vermont Municipal Employee Retirement System. And this is for all the non-teaching staff. So I'm a member of this, our custodians are, our food service workers are, our paraprofessionals are, but the teachers are in another one. Uh, you do pay towards this retirement and they're not in bad shape, but we do have $722,000 obligation towards that, their deficit. Again, if we were to close our school tomorrow, we wouldn't have to write a check for that amount of money, but as we, if we keep open and keep going forward, eventually we'll pay that portion or what that happens to be over the life of their um, restoration plan. Okay. One more thing I want to show you is the Windsor Central SU audit. And I'll go through this briefly, but there are a couple key points. Again, same audit letter, no findings, everything is good. Um, we did do a, a restatement. At the SU, we had $877,000 more revenue than we budgeted. So the SU has had a lot of revenue. On the spending side, we spent $205,000 more than we budgeted but of that spending, $709,000 was a sub-recipient payment to the school district. Okay, so of what we budgeted, we underspent by about a half million dollars, but with the sub-recipient um, money to uh, the school district, which was the food service funds that come in to the SU that we transfer the district. Um, it was over spent by 205000 So we gained half a million dollars of fund balance here. So what we lost in the school district, we made up here. So real quickly, on June 30th, we had a fund balance of $1.6 million at the district, which is an increase of $612,000 over the prior year. So although the school district, we've got to work a little bit on getting better on that budget. The SU has lots of money in it. And, you know, so financially, we're not in bad shape. One of the things that I wanted to point out here, though, is the schedule of expenditures of federal funds, federal awards. In school, in school year that ended June 30th, 20, 2022, we received and spent $2,989,195 of federal funds at the SU, and then the $709,724 we transferred to the district. So that all comes to a little over $3 million of federal funds, $3,690,919 of federal funds that we received and spent on the at the district last year. And people forget about that. That's a significant part of our budget. 
And so I just I wanted to point that out to you. Um, another thing that's important, if you remember last year, under our federal audit, our single audit act, we actually had a finding of substance and we had to write a corrective action plan. The finding of substance was the fact that we didn't do the timesheets on the grants. And but that's that's a big thing. And I had to write a, a corrective action plan and get it accepted by the federal government or else they would stop our funding. Um, not a big deal. We did it. Life has gone forward. This year we had no findings at all. And so, you know, the things that we didn't do right, we've gotten better. And that is what I wanted to show you. Um, there's more here, the long-term obligation, all the same things I presented to you on the district. But the important thing is we've got a strong fund balance at the SU. We got to work on the school district. And Jim, when you say fund balance, can you put that in layman's terms for everybody who doesn't maybe know what you're talking about? Fund balance is not cash, but it's the difference between what we owe and what we have. So it's fund balance is kind of like a savings account, some of which you can spend. But it's surplus? Is that a fair way? Uh, it's not a word that in my language. <laughs> in your language, it's surplus. <laughs> Not a word in my vocabulary. Well, are there any questions for Jim? Yeah, just a couple of quickies. Um, the where does the revenue come from for the WCSU, and why was that so much more than anticipated last year? Um, mostly it was uh, grants, the federal grants. Um, a lot of it was the extra funds and things that had not been budgeted two years ago, three years ago, before we even knew that some of these extra funds were coming through. Um, the revenue at the supervisory union comes through federal grant, federal funds, a lot of state funds, because all of our special ed services are part of the yes, supervisory union. So even though all the teachers and staff were in all the buildings, the state has made us put them all as members of the S supervisory union. So that comes mostly through the state. Um, the rest of our funds come from the school district. So the school district pays for superintendent services, business office services, tech services, and special ed services. So whatever we don't get from the state comes from the taxpayers through the uh, assessment process. So, so does the money in the SU flow to the district? Flow through? I mean, if you have sort of an understanding that. So the, the surplus at the dist at the SU, yeah. what we'll do is we will reduce our assessment to the district. So the district won't have to pay as much. We'll spend down okay. some of our, so if next year you'll show that I will show you probably that we brought in half a million dollars less revenue at the SU than we did. Uh, than we had for expenses. We used some of our surplus and we'll reduce the expenditure side by half a million dollars on the district side. And it will all eventually, you know, wash slowly. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I, we, we have a problem at the, at the district we need to work on, but it's not earth shattering. We are solid. We have to, um, Fix a couple of cash flows. A lot of zeros in those numbers, but it's not there. Yes, sir. I think you just started answering my question, but I'll just make sure. So in the year where we spent more than we, we brought in for revenue, you said we, we we should be concerned, we should address it, but it sounds like the district funds are offsetting some of that. So are we are we gonna have to like in a future budget? bring in more revenue than our actual expenses to sort of make us whole for that mistake? We are going to have to stop authorizing appropriations above our budget. Yeah. So when the voters approve a budget, we have to stop authorizing additions after that because that's part of our problem. Um, and at some point we may have to put together a deficit appropriation plan so that we decide that 
over the next five years, we're going to raise $100,000 more than we spend to reduce a half million, million dollar deficit. And we'll need to build a plan and implement it. Right now, we're not in bad shape because we've got all the surplus at the S at the SU that we will slowly, you know, reduce the appropriation from the district, which will ease the pain, but we'll need to, you know, make sure that we change, we reverse this so that our revenues meet or exceed our expenses. So if it's cash flow issues, do we have to, every once in a while, take short-term loans to cover things? We take a short-term loan called the tax anticipation note, and that'll come to you in June. And uh, we'll be asking you to authorize $3.2 million of tax anticipation note. That's the same amount that we did last year or for this year. And at our peak in November, we used 2.6 or 2.8 million of it. So we use a lot of it. Uh, right now, we, we have um, some money in the bank. We haven't paid off that loan yet. Uh, we will get Woodstock's tax payment in the next couple of weeks, as soon as that comes in, we will pay off the loan. We we need to keep it out until that comes in in order to make sure we can meet payroll on our expenses in the meantime, because Woodstock's tax payment is fairly significant. What is the um, this might be coming over in June, but what's the interest rate on that uh, nearly late? Um, this year it's around 2.6. Uh, next year we're looking at a little bit four percent. So it's one up. Um, and what we we tried to do is not borrow it, and, and we we will run our accounts really tight in the fall until tax revenue starts coming in, um, and trying not to borrow anything uh, because Woodstock again, who is a significant payment, they don't make the second payment until June first. We have to, we have to keep some of that money because it's not like the line of credit. Once we pay part of it back, we can't take it back again. So it's not a fluctuating line of credit. When we pay it back, we're done. We lost access to those funds. And so um, the structure of it is we need to keep it borrowed until we get that final payment. All right, well, Chancellor, thank you very much. Thank you. You spoke a second language to me tonight. <laughs> thank you very much, though, for but all that you do. Please take a look at everything. Um, and don't be afraid to email me with questions. Thank you. No, he's now now he's playing a couple of bubbles. <laughs> Jim, you're up again with the bus. <laughs> okay. Last last fall working with um, the Adequiche Twin Rivers uh, Regional Planning Commission uh, and Butler Bus, we wrote a grant and received a grant for $1.2 million to get three electric buses and some charging stations. Uh, we put it out to bid. We put it out to four bus companies. And I did what I call a turnkey uh, bid. I don't know very much about any of this stuff as far as the electric buses or the engineering and electrical things we need to do to charge them. I know the big picture, but I don't know the important details. And so I put it on as a turnkey and asked them to bid not only three buses, but the installation of chargers. And so we did. Uh, one bus company um, just couldn't get their act together and didn't bid. But Anderson Bluebird bid, Lion Bus bid, and Cressy Thomas bid. Um, Emo, uh, uh, Butler Bus, and I went through and evaluated all of the bids. Um, we essentially had bids on four different four four different bids for buses. Anderson bid three seventy three hundred seventy five thousand dollars each for a Bluebird bus. Lion was three seventy four nine ninety nine sixty nine, so three hundred seventy five thousand. And Cressy Thomas gave two bids for us, one at three forty three seven fifty, which was exactly as spent, and the other one, which was 
started at 342.5 is what they call the early stock bus. Um, we have raised that price by $4,500 because one of the options we wanted was a rear plug in for the charging port and the ones that they have on order have front ports. So they had to get a harness and run it to the back of the bus, which is a $4,500 charge for the harness installation. Um, they were the low bidders, uh, which thrilled us because Thomas Bus is what we're running for most of our buses. Uh, so all of the non-electrical parts, you know, the lights, the doors, the windows, and all those things were all interchangeable with the inventory that uh, Bob was already running. Then we looked at charging. Charging was all over the board. And essentially what we spec'd was two uh, level two chargers. What we learned was we wanted something different than that. And what we've ended up doing is going with the option three on the chargers, which is one level two 30 kilowatt DC charger and one level three rapid charge 60 kilowatt DC charger. Uh, DC charger, I learned, is important because these buses don't have charging um, systems on them like a lot of your electric cars do. And so you have to use DC, not AC chargers. Uh, what's nice about the 60 kilowatt charger is that it will rapid charge a bus in two hours, where the 30 kilowatt will take six to eight hours. You can plug two buses into either one of these and it essentially splits the power. So on the 60 kilowatt, we can charge in two buses, get 30 kilowatts on each bus and charge uh, the buses in anywhere from two to six hours, depending on what level they're at. Um, after talking with bus manufacturers, several charging companies, charging install uh, installers and Green Mountain Power was giving us a grant towards part of this. Um, we decided that the best option was the most expensive option on the charges, and we went with the 30 kilowatt and one 30 kilowatt and one 60 kilowatt charger. So what we're now asking you to do is authorize us to award the bid to Pressy, WC Pressy, Thomas Bus, and their subcontractors for 1,167,192. I think Jim, you say we, um, Jim brought this to the finance committee a couple of weeks ago, and um, we uh, are recommending to the board the Cressy Thomas uh, option. Is there a motion to uh, put that on the table? Yeah, I'll make the motion. That's Anna. We'll make the motion to bring it up. Is there a second? Right now we can discuss for. Yeah, okay. Is there any option of the charging being able to use by teachers or anybody else when the time when the buses are out or anything? Or? I'm glad you asked. Okay. <laughs> uh, these chargers, no. Okay. But working with Green Mountain Power, by the end of this month, they're going to have a grant to install two car chargers out here at no cost to us. And so we're bringing over to our telephone pole where the chargers are going to connect enough power and when we're trenching we're going to trench to two more concrete pads so we can put two more car chargers so not part of this project but in conjunction with this project we will bring in enough power and hopefully by sometime in the fall um, have chargers for cars uh, we have a superintendent who's going to have a a, a car that needs to be plugged in really soon and um, so she's excited about this, and uh, all of us are. Yeah. Um, Josh. So um, I, I will be at distances on these. What are the what is the main purpose of these buses? Are these just going to be route buses, or are these going to be trip buses? Because the range is 120 miles. They're, they're going to be route buses, and because of the way we work this, they're going to be Woodstock and Barner route buses right now. Because working with Ottaquichi. Those are the two of our towns that they work with. And so they asked us to put the first electric buses in the towns that they're, they also represent. Um, one of the things I'm working on, and that has nothing to do with this, but a lot to do with this, 
is, for instance, White River School District also got three buses. Rutland has some electric buses. Up toward Burlington, there's some electric buses. So I'm reaching out to my counterparts around the state and saying, hey, here's a deal. I'll let you plug in at no charge on our 60 kilowatt charger when you bring a team here, if you'll let us do that when we go to your school. So what we're trying to do is build a network of school districts so that we can share our infrastructure because there's not enough commercial infrastructure out there yet to do much traveling outside of the district. The charges match up, even if they don't go with it. The commercial charges match up. So a 30 or a 60 kilowatt DC charger match up. Okay. So, you know, this, this is my initiative, not theirs, but you know, I'm working with them, I'm talking with Green Mountain Power. There's a lot of people who are really interested in doing something with this, so um, it's going to happen. Great, Anna, I think you have a question and Ben. Yeah, if I could bring it back to the idea of having two um, or uh, some number of chargers that are not bus chargers, but rather vehicles chargers. Um, if we have students and teachers plugging into those where, um, who would be paying for those, the costs to use those uh, electrical hours? If, if you remember when I first talked about this, I, I floated this idea and if I'm not mistaken, Bryce said, I think this is a great idea as long as we don't use any of our money. And um, so I've designed it so that we don't use any of our money. And if you're charging on our chargers here, uh, you'll need to use your credit card, your account to charge on our charger. Sorry, sure. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that doesn't mean as a board, you can't give it a ben as a benefit, but right now they need their credit cards. <laughs> All right, then. Just speaking to the motion on the table, the Cressy Thomas option uh, for the Finance Committee, the thing that really drove that was the uh, the fact that other districts are using, we're using those buses, those are parts are available. And the second thing is the early option that they've got buses in inventory to be able to get us buses and, uh, like, what, a year before the others. I, I apologize because I missed talking about that. If we went with the buses that we spent, we get them probably October of 2020. Four. With the early options, we ought to have the buses running by October of 23, so this fall. Yeah. All right. Um, Just one more question, quick question. Um, what is the average place to have all the buses for every week that we have out here? Um, the diesel buses have a typical lifespan of seven to nine years. These buses, uh, the drive trains have a more typical lifespan of 12 to 15 years. So as long as the New England salt doesn't destroy the sheet metal, the buses will have a, uh, you know, a little bit longer lifespan. Unless it miscalculated the life of the batteries, because that is still a little bit unproven. And, and, and the batteries, I think they're coming with a seven or 10 year guarantee, but you're right. Um, and I have to look at the details again, but, uh, yeah, the batteries are still the, the weak link in the technology. So will this be replacing one of the current fleet or in addition? Part of the deal with EPA is we have to actually cut a bus in half and drill a hole through the motor. So for each bus we put on, we have to get rid of a bus. And so Emo's got three buses that are, he was going to retire this year anyways, and so he's going to destroy them. Are we ready to vote? All in favor of authorizing this um, bid, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Well, Jim, great work. Um, it's very impressive what you've done last year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next All right. up is the WCSU name change. Um, at a previous meeting, we changed the name of the WCUUSD to start in the one one as Mountain View School District. But we also um, would like to change the Windsor Central Supervisory Union to the Mountain View Supervisory Union. So I need a motion to make that um, that. So moved. Second. All right, Ben, you have a question? Yeah, just point of order. Are we currently in session at both boards? 
Is that what's happening when you call the meeting to order? Well, good. well it is a joint meeting. It's a joint meeting. Okay, great. So we can take that vote. Yes. Yeah. Is there any discussion on the change? Was this just like, was it just an oversight initially? Or it was a, it was a process. Uh -huh. So we never formally discussed changing the district name, but I mean, we did yeah. talk about it, but we didn't officially do it at that time. The SUV. And so what was the process leading up to the decision that we ought to do that? Well, it seems weird to see the Mount Schools a Mountain View school district, but have a different supervised reunion name. How does Pittsfield feel about this? Ray? Ray, do you have any comments? Pittsfield loves the name Mountain View's supervisory union and uh, really there's no reason to have anything separate. Keep it all together. Thank you. So for it. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. You really are a cheerleader in your life. I don't say much. <laughs> it's always positive, though. So to those of us that are were not here for December 5th, 2022 meeting, why was it changed in the first place? It's been this this Bunja County Central Supervisory Union for eons. What made it change? Just because I don't know the backstory. Well, um, Sherry can probably tell you better than this, but the word Windsor Central refers to our, our um, what's the word I want? Uniform. No, our, it's the county. Our county. <laughs> Sorry. Right. I'm still thinking about those numbers. Um, our yeah. county. And it was basically the state sat down and chopped up the whole state and said, okay, this is the Windsor County districts and said Windsor Central, Windsor Northeast, Windsor Southwest, whatever they all are, orange is in some of them. And um, over time, a lot of school districts in the in the state have changed their name to better reflect their communities. So you have Grand Valley uh, or Slate Valley over on the, on the western side of the state. You have um, other districts that have changed or they simply like Hartford is one school district. They have all their schools are in their district. They kept them in the Hartford School District. So it was really an attempt to say, uh, what does Windsor Central mean? So there was a lot of discussion around that. Also, Sherry has told us that often that it's confusing because people think Windsor Central must have Windsor in it, uh, Windsor High School. So mail goes to the wrong places and there's confusion about it. So um, the configuration um, and enrollment working group uh, had, a, had a lot of parties come voices with there were reach outs to the communities there were meetings to talk about um you know this and it was it was controversial for sure it was a you know not a strong majority but there was enough of the majority that the, that the decision at the board level was to uh, move it forward and then have a district naming contest and invite our area schools to submit names so that was the process every school submitted names um, and then there was a public vote on that. People were allowed to vote. Um, and it came to two mountain views or in one. So, John? Just one more. Uh, going back to when we um, did a, a retreat to um, endorse the strategic plan, one of the strategic plan goals, this is strategy 9.1, was to name and brand the district and campuses to build a shared identity, enhancing district pride, and designing dispersion promotional materials, highlighting district programs and outcomes. So that was something that we identified, you know, four and a half years ago as uh, kind of a to-do. And this was the follow through that, that carries so. Right, and it's, you know, Killington is not part of Windsor. So there's always that confusion. And there are four other districts that are WCSU in the state of Vermont. So you have Washington Central, Wyndham Central, Windsor Central, and then there's Windsor Southeast. So it really, in terms of who we are and what we reflect, it really was thinking about how do we bring identity to what our experience is here? So and, and nobody has anything close to Mountain Views? No, no one has Mountain <laughs> Some of the ones we, you know, were tossed out as um, good contenders have already been taken. So rivers, because all of our communities have rivers, um, the Ottaquichi School District, well, there's an Ottaquichi School right down the road. So, um, and there were a couple of others that came up that, uh, oh, Central, I think, 
uh, Anna was on this group too, it was, you know, central Vermont. Well, there's already a central Vermont. They're actually really kind of north, but I wouldn't say they're central, but um, so anyway, there were quite a few names submitted. We culled the list as a committee, as a working group down. Um, some of them were, you know, what you might think elementary school students or perhaps high school students mm -hmm. would, would supply that had nothing to do with anything. Um, and uh, we had, I think we had four that we came down to and the vote uh, was pretty strong for mountain views. We added the S to it because there's more than one mountain involved. And there's another city in California. Oh, is there? There's Mountain View. Oh, 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 that's right. Right. We did identify that. Sacramento was taken. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's kind of the history of it. And it got unanimous support by the board mm -hmm. at the time, right? That they could pass 100 percent so in terms of the the piece of the strategic plan that Ben noted, are there are there thoughts that you know once this name is changed, well I guess the district has already changed, there will be other sort of like obviously where there's going to be like a whole rebranding kind of thing that has to happen along with that, right? In terms of like logos. Yes, and that that's why we push it back to to July one. So we we have talked about having. Um, a, uh, a student competition again, or even community members could submit logo ideas. So just to kind of update, we we need to move with a logo a little faster than a competition, <laughs> and our students' capacity at this point in time is pretty. So okay. Raina has two options she'd like to bring forward to the June board meeting. Right. Because when we change domains, we really need to start moving forward. Yeah. Um, and our student are tapped out right now. Right. They just yeah. don't have a yeah. capacity. Yeah. Yeah. So Raina, however. Done some amazing research and solicited lots of people in this office. The brain that used AI. So the June board meetings, we'd like to bring two logos for the board. Okay, great. For the, for the Mount Views. For the Mount Views. Okay. So we, we've already voted the, um, the school district name. Now we have to vote the uh, supervisory union name. So that's what the motion is on the table for us. Are there any other comments, questions? Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, it has passed. Making Raina very happy. <laughs> All right, the next thing um, we have to do tonight are approve some new hires. For the district, we have. Um, do you want to read the monastery? Or sure. Our, um, we, I'd like to submit the name of Brandon Hill for our Reading Elementary School principal position. Um, I'd like to submit Lori Jean Galland as our uh, assistant principal for Woodstock Elementary School. Um, I won't read through the, the extensive resumes here. Um, Aaron Butcher, who some of you may know, has been our extended learning coordinator. He has also been covering at Woodstock Elementary. Um, I'd like to submit his name for our fourth, fifth, sixth grade position at Barnard Academy. And moving along, Martha Davis will fill um, to fill one of our special education positions at the Middleton High School that has been open since December with a resignation then. So Martha would be um, filling that position, extensive experience. Um, Janine Osaragusa, am I saying that right? I think so. Okay. Um, will be coming to us as our full time school psychologist with lots of experience. Excited about that. That was a position over the last year that we've done some outside contracting for the new year. So that position will be full. And that's it. it. Yes. And then we'll get us pretty close to how we'll have all our classroom positions full. We have some special ed positions full, but in comparison to other districts in the state of Ohio, we are in really good shape. Um, and uh, often we are looking for people well through July and into August. I think we'll be we'll have some schools, uh, speech language pathologist positions. We have a special ed position, school counselor, but and the big picture of things, we're very happy about where we are and the people that we're moving forward in these conditions. 
All right. Um, I would like to vote those through as a group. So, all in favor of acceptance? No, we have to make, to make, make a motion. nomination. Sorry, somebody needs to make the motion. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, okay. and a second. I'll second. Thank you very much. All in favor of approving these um, positions, please say aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Um, we also have some resignations to accept. Um, and we have Gabriella Durgan from the Wissagina High School Middle School Guidance Department. Garen, would you be willing to say a few words about Gabriella? Yeah, big words for Gabriella, I would say, is like short time, really big impact. Gabriella was a great addition to our school. She, um, she took on as the director of counseling this year and did a lot of work around our school profiling for colleges or college admission pieces. So she needs like a rich break to do it. So we're really sad to lose her. And she sees more letters she has quick one needs to get to attend to. Um, so even Mr. Well, and again, short time, really big impact. Her. Okay, and we also have um, Richard Carney, who is the driver's ed teacher, who has decided to uh, move on and teach somewhere else. Um, I'd be happy to say a few words about Rich. He's sure. um, on the board that I'm on. Uh, he's a straightforward, straight up former policeman. And when you get in the car, there's to learn to drive. He's all business and he gets you through it and holds to all rules at all times. <laughs> so although he can be rigid at times or it seem rigid, he, there are standards around grade point averages and getting your license and things like that. He really is a, a teddy bear in many ways. So although he's been a thorn in my side more than once <laughs> um, on things, he's a great guy and um, he just hopes that you'll all keep the program open. All right, and I think, is there one more? No, just, just to clarify that by law, we have to have a driver's education program. So he seems to be definitely afraid that it's going to go away. So the law will not allow us to do that. There may be other formats that the law, uh, the law allows us to have, but we must offer driving education to our students at no cost to the parents. And that was just clarified recently. Okay, I will send him that email. There's a memo from the state. Do you want it? I have. Oh, please send it to me. Yes. That's not. All right. Um, we are just accepting the resignations. I don't believe we need to make a motion on that. Do we, Raina? I don't think we do. I think we've had this discussion before. I mean, because sometimes it's hard to say no. Okay. Not saying no. Right. Okay. Um, all right, and uh, now um, Elliot has copious amounts of papers. Oh, sorry. Oh, sure, sorry. I'll, I'll give a brief update. Oh, we we met, we right. talked about uh, several things that came from uh, Jim's office. I will be coming back uh, to the board next month on uh, the general obligation notes. Those are the the, uh, the war articles that were uh, passed by the budget. We need to make some decisions around, um, you know, uh, borrowing to fulfill those um, programs. And uh, just that we also talked about the tax anticipation note and as um, Jim shared with Josh uh, during his presentation on the budget, we are gonna be looking at a much higher interest rate on the TAN just due to changes in interest rates. So uh, we'll, we'll preview the finance update. I guess I just don't. Cool. So uh, we do have five uh, policies to discuss. Two of them have uh, we've already discussed. So um, the first one of those is the grading policy. Uh, this is um, the second reading tonight. And basically, as you remember, this is a policy essentially uh, for the purpose of integrating um, three systems into one to for ease for the students and for the staff. So um, we are seeking to uh, actually have a, a motion to have it adopted at the next meeting. So I guess I would like to. I think we need you, Carrie. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Take over the system. All right. <laughs> okay. Is there a motion to adopt the grading policy at the next meeting? So moved. Is there a second? I'll say. Any discussion? All in favor of uh, adopting the grading policy at the next meeting, mm -hmm. moving to adopt the meeting, uh, at the next meeting, say aye. 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 All right. 
Yeah, I said it. Motion passed. Okay, so the next one that we've also already discussed is the school crisis prevention response policy, and we have discussed that at several different meetings. It has not changed since last meeting, and so the motion we would tonight, uh, like to have tonight is for adoption. I'll keep going. Is there a motion to adopt the uh, school crisis and prevention policy? So moved. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, discussion. All in favor of adopting the school crisis prevention response policy say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Motion passes. So now we have the first of three new policies. Uh, the first one is the um, C21 search and seizure. This is um, basically one of the ones recommended by the Vermont uh, School Board Association. And I think it came up in some of our discussions when we were talking about discipline issues um, earlier in the year. So essentially the policy is um, from their template, from the VSBA template, um, and it just uh, delineates the rights of uh, the schools to search its own property and also student property under certain, and it sort of goes over the circumstances. Um, and also, I think part of the policy is that it, it is to be put into the handbooks of the different schools. So um, I would like to have it presented for a second reading the next time. Keep going. I have to check something. All right. Uh, is there a motion to uh, uh, move the policy to a second reading? I don't have to move. Oh, man. Thank you, Corinne. Is there a second? Oh, thank you, John. Discussion of the policy? We have a chance to so, so look this at. will be discussed for approval later because I want to do some research yeah. on, on this mm -hmm. one, okay. sure. especially with Tap with Title 14 and where it falls into legal get legality being where school versus law enforcement, how this plays in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's where, where, where personal, you know, that's all going to be a big. Yep. I want to know about this. Yeah, there are three bites at the apple. You've got your first reading, second reading, and adoption, right? Okay. So this is the first time it comes. We moved it sec um, to a second reading. And if you have um, things mm -hmm. come out of your review, you can take them up to the next meeting. Yeah, that's why. Elliot, so was there, so yeah, I mean, I think the piece that is the the one that brings up questions is there's a, not necessarily questions, but curiosity. Um, under search and seizure of, of student property, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously this states that searches and seizures have to be conducted in a manner that comply with state and federal constitutional protection against unreasonable searches and seizures of students and student property in schools. Um, so was there talk about like how once we adopt this or if we adopt this, like, do we need to develop protocols to sort of make sure that or not, um, that that is sort of in, enforced or you know that well, again, I, I would think that falls under procedures with the web yeah that would be the superintendent I mean, so you and a team would sort of like figure out what the well and this is practice I mean this is practice yeah. now yeah. I mean, this codifies and Garen you can speak this codifies Something that's been placed for years, right. um, but it gives clarity, especially in the handbook, to parents. Mm -hmm. You know, clarity is kindness. Your child's car, car is here, and we have reasonable suspicion right. that there's, you know, and Garen, you want to speak to that? Yeah, when I read the policy, the policy is essentially informing people what the laws are. I mean, right. that's really what it is. That like, the laws are, as it says, school property is school property as noted, and then there are. The guidelines that are protections around as you're saying you have the protections we have around search to make sure it's done properly but um again it is it really is taking a look of what well about. that's why i was just wondering who was yeah. written from right well it's yeah, one of my main questions was, right it's totally is that we read wrote or is yeah. it so yeah. many things i stopped it um, briefly so many of the policies that we have come from different places but many most of them come from the vermont school board it's like they uh, templates. Okay. And I was just curious, please. You see that at the top. You're no, like, well, that's just mine. I touch my format and said I put it on. It's okay. But, but these are, that's why they're labeled as, uh, you know, code 
B21 and everything. And, um, and just so, well, everybody knows, I mean, on the policy committee, we have several policies that are recommended, but not, you know, that they don't have to be there, suggested by BSBA. And we have them like sort of in a queue, and we have them on our queue that we wanted to bring this up. And as I said, it did come up, I think, in passing um, this spring when we started that issue. So that's why we wrote it. Matt? Yeah, I'm really happy to see this brought forward. I was on your committee when I recommended that we also add this as a priority. Yeah. Um, even if it's just restating what's already in law and what's already being practiced by having it as a policy, right. it'll help uh, enforce the training for teachers. And I know we just hired Mark Donka, maybe he can train folks, but um, a lot of the reports I've read about school shootings, um, one of the we one of the things that sort of breaks apart early on is that teachers don't understand when they have a right to search property. So they might have reasonable cause, but they doubt themselves and they don't search a backpack. And in the end, they could have saved lives. So I'm really glad that we've, we've added this policy for a for a treating. Um, I mean, oh, Anna. Yeah, Elliot, do you know if at the state level in uh, the group that authored this, do you know if they ever sent it through a filter of like um, either racial or gender biases? And I, I asked. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Do you mind if I? Yeah, no, you know. No, I'm just so uh, I would. This is very much on their consideration. They've reviewed all their policies in terms of bias biases. Um, and I think this is one of the newer reviews. That, that is my understanding of what they're doing is really to ensure that um, there's a lens when anything is being moved forward for adoption um, with that regard. So thank you, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah. Yes. Is, there, is there anything on the flip side of that if um, LRO, the school, feels like they need to search people's belongings and nothing turns up? Say this person has it happen a second or third time throughout the year for different reasons. Uh, I just feel, I mean, I support it. I'm just curious on does the school get to actually have to prove reasonable doubt and whatnot? And if so, and they're wrong, uh, what's the procedure after that? Karen, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the, so the standard is different. It's called reasonable suspicion, not reasonable doubt. So suspicion is just the, the threshold for safety is, or the burden, the threshold for a search is lower because the safety is true. So it's reasonable suspicion. So the threshold for searching one's belongings is a lot less than a, a private citizen of one of these belongings. The point I bring up is a good one, which is if there's a place where somebody is repeatedly being searched and nothing's being, being found, what's happening here and i i would say you know this is just speaking out like that's the place of, of communication between the school and the parents and, and the child that doesn't matter it's like what's happening here um so you know it's hard to know the specifics but i think that's a great one to be thinking about some of the data we saw before we're seeing repeated incidents like what what's happening here, right right and there's many, okay. multiple venues for parents yeah. to form a complaint against a school right regarding patterns of behavior, which right. may be based on discrimination, could be based on right. So there are different pathways that parent or a, a student can pursue if they're believing that they're being treated unfairly. We'll see that, that was, that, that's what I was going to get. Yes, so right. I, I guess, is, at what point do we, like, like we have a policy, I, I understand that, but what I'm saying, like if policy is used in a inappropriate form, mm -hmm. and search and seizure is done in an inappropriate, Mm -hmm. Time period or the current number of occurrences, there's a point where it becomes a liability. So I just wanted to, like, that's mm -hmm. one of the things I just kind of want to make sure we cover in this is at what point do we put a safeguard out so that mm -hmm. we don't end up liable? Yeah. But I don't think you can't build that into a policy. But that might be there's procedural. Really that, be procedural around the policy, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Right. No, it's it's procedural. Procedural. Oh, exactly. I agree. Hey, you can't do it. Like, you know, after three times, you can't do it. Right. You slap that in the policy. You can't micromanage. Do you want to weigh on? Yeah. I just wanted to say, I started by saying this is federal law, but the more I'm listening to it, it's like, this is why it's good to have the policy because the information. So if someone feels like like being treated fairly, well, here's the policy to help you in the conversation. So I, I really want to say I'm supporting this like, policy. It may sound like I'm saying it's unnecessary. No, no, no. I actually think it's quite good. Right. And I'm then the procedures yeah. have where you appeal decisions. 
And so we see that in different types, you see that in our HHR harassment and bullying, there are processes for appealing a decision, but those are procedural. That's not, does not live in a policy. But well, yeah, I would just, oh, sorry. Yeah. Is there a way to um, configure Alma to record that data specifically searches so that we can be, so that before a parent or a student makes a complaint, we can be like, hey, yeah. We searched this person five times for no reason. Maybe we should do something about yeah. that. Yeah. It is because the search is done in response to if an incident reported. We think somebody has a cigarette, right? Whatever it is, that, and then what's the follow up? There would be a, potentially a search based on that. So we do report in that way. And, so and it's always response to correct. It's always a response to it. the incident needs to be in there so that we report a response, which mm -hmm. may be a search. Correct. Yeah, sure. yeah just. Wanted to note that it seems like when this policy moves forward, it'd be important to have those procedures develop very, very, you know, quickly. And and maybe this maybe some mention of of uh, you know the whatever requirements there might be. That this is also important, comma, but not have it standing out there without the procedures, uh, you know, attached um, for very long. Other comments on the motion to move the search and seizure to a policy? To do a I may ask you something that on, on the back, I want to ask uh, Raz. So, is is it searchable or is it in a, in, a, in other words, would that be a data point that's searchable that you could, or, yeah. or does it just get put into like, you know, the text or something? Yeah. So, we have some ability to configure, but like a chance that usually an incident precipitates it. So, right. so, so, so what would I mean, some of it's the way we use it, right? So how do we define it? So the way we've configured it right now is we define those incidents. And, and so then there would be some narrative describing what the- Right, but about. would you be able to, let's say, have a field of, I want to just find out how many kids got searched. Well, there's all that menu. And yeah. What is it like? Yes, another word is to that. Yes, no, right. everything. And then- I think we have that. Sure. Or, or yeah, do you have the flexibility to put that in? I think we do. Yeah. I think that the challenge is like, there can often be like two things that are. Well, how many searches were done? You know, wouldn't that yeah. be the end of the note? I mean, yeah, how yeah. many insults into yeah. the search in there? Anyway, yeah. sorry. Sounds like you guys had a lot to talk yeah. about. <laughs> you guys do the work. Oh, and so, one addition based on this conversation is that I'm looking at the superintendent in terms of procedures. Um, it's really not talking about procedures. Um, and so maybe there's some language that you want to add in terms of what kinds of procedures you want the superintendents to develop, which may include what are uh, parents and our families and students' um, rights in terms of uh, appealing the decision or addressing. So you're saying suggesting that in include in the policy mm -hmm. a, a directive that a requirement for priest procedures. Right. Yeah. Uh, which uh, could uh, include which could include or which would include mm -hmm. um, a process for yeah. something like that. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll give you the words, but if you if that's what I'm hearing from this group, that it should be in there because right now it is not requiring that of the superintendent. Mm -hmm. All right. Any further comments on the motion on the floor, which is to move the search and seizure policy to the second reading. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. The motion passes the search and seizure over to a second reading. Carrie, you want to? Sure. Uh, the next one um, is administration of federal grant funds. Yeah, so these two have been recommended by uh, Jim Finn to comply with the uh, Basically, our federal grants, and so the basic the one that's twenty five pages to go is, you know, various regulations relating to the acceptance of federal funds, and um, we are required to have it. Anything you want to add on? Um, only we we've, we've gone through. We have our third food service audit tomorrow, and they cited us for not having this policy and the conflict of interest policy. I do have food service procedures that I wrote that they're somewhat satisfied with, but they want us to have a full policy. But we're also doing three capital projects with federal funds over the next 12 months, and we won't get our funding without the policy in place. So let's do it. <laughs> 
So we can move it probably to a, a DOP next month, correct? We don't need to have a second reading of a required policy. Seems like we might as well move forward. Sounds good. Okay. And the other one is so we have to, yeah. Do we need a motion to adopt we need a motion to adopt in the next uh at the next meeting? So moved. Second. Any further discussion or questions? Okay, all in favor say aye, please. Aye. Aye. And then the last so one. So the last one is, you know, it goes along with this, but it, it's basically that we have in place a conflict of interest in terms of procurements, and it's the same idea. And um, that, you know, we're required to have it, as Jim said. So, and okay. we adopted it. So shall, uh, would somebody make a motion to adopt at the next meeting? I'll make a motion to adopt. Thank you, Josh. I'll second. Okay, thank you, Matt. I have a question. Yes. Should we go ahead and change the name to the mountain views <laughs> in here so that well, that's the agenda okay. to authorize me to go in and, and just change the name of the mountain? Great. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor. <laughs> Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's it. For right. Me. We're now into the next group here as buildings and grounds committee have a report. Um, I'll give a brief update. We did meet. We met over at uh, Prosper Valley School. It's a beautiful building in very good shape. Um, some of the highlights uh, for the heat conversion project at the middle school, high school. Uh, Ultimately, the district declined JCI's proposal, but there were two vendors, Alliance Mechanical, is doing a lot of the mechanical work, and then JCI that does the system integration or the energy management system. Um, J JCI's proposal was very high. They, they did not sharpen their pencils. So the plan going forward is to put some of that scope into Alliance Mechanical's work. And then when we need to do the proprietary work that JCI has for the energy control systems, we actually already have a JCI contract in place. And so we'll add it to that existing contract as, as scope changes. Um, so even though we're not getting a new fixed price contract from JCI, um, it's likely that Alliance Mechanical may do the work for, for less cost. And their, their, their dollar per hour rate for their technicians is almost half of what Alliance Mechanical is. So um buildings and ground very much supported Joe's approach. And we think that helps us come in line with the budget for the, the bond that was the, the debt that was passed for that work. Um, our committee reviewed the capital improvement plan. Specifically, we looked at items that were in the fiscal year 2024 budget. Um, we discussed some upcoming RFPs. Uh, there were bids received to repay the parking lot at Reading Elementary School. Uh, there will be uh, an RFP to repair uh, the dirt driveway and parking lot behind TPBS. And then we will issue an RFP for HVAC work that needs to happen at Reading and Wes uh, for next summer, 2024. And then we ended with a discussion on uh, the various campuses approach to snow plowing and uh, groundskeeping and the general consensus or rec recommendation is that wherever towns are willing and have the capacity to perform this work, we'll keep that we'll keep it that way to take advantage of that current investment in the equipment and human resources. So, for example, Barnard does plowing and uh, groundskeeping, but but if other towns are not willing to do that work, like we asked Pomper and they said they did not have the capacity, then we will look at. Um, possibly bringing that in-house. So currently we subcontract to a third party uh, groundskeeping and some of the snow removal at our campuses at WES, um, TPBS, and um, yeah. here at the school. And those third parties are pretty expensive. So Joe has looked at basically buying two trucks, each with equipped with a plow, and in the summer, those trucks could pull equipment back and forth between these campuses. It's kind of a tight circuit between 
West, the middle school, high school, and Crossing the Valley. Um, as a committee, we didn't approve that proposal. We just sort of listened to the rationale. And he's going to work with Jim on pricing out equipment and looking at sort of overall cost to hire one full time employee plus these two trucks. And then we already have other employees that can can help um, compared to our current cost to pay contractors to do all this work. And the the back of the envelope says it will be saving us a good deal of money, so it will be helping the budget. But they're going to run the numbers and come back to the committee. That's that's our update. Any questions? Do they think that with two plow trucks they can get three schools plowed in a morning? Yeah, so I had that same question, and that's what the current contractors use is two trucks here. Uh -huh. um, so they they felt like they can go, and they're going to be doing it like every five inches of snow, so they're going to yeah. rotate across the campuses. Um, and I, I'll just make a note that. Out, out of this scope is actual snow removal. So the, on the sidewalks in the building. So we already do that ourselves. So this is just for mm -hmm. plowing lots, parking lots. Mm -hmm. We already do all the shoveling of the walkways and all the removal of snow that blocks um, exits um, that come off the roof. The snow comes off the roof. So that we already do. So does, for example, does the district pay the town of Barnard to do that part? It just goes into their town budget, which means the taxpayers pay for it either way. And it's a little more complicated at Barnard. Uh, so just... <laughs> well, I'm just curious that they'll pay for it directly. We pay for it, you know, in the town, but then we'd also pay into the pool of, you know, the unified district that's paying for these. Well, that's the same. Well, I think what he's saying is it's no longer, it's not listed as a line item in our budget because the town covers it in the town budget. I think that's what he's saying, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. true. But I think their point is different. But then if we cover is there a lot more to that story because yeah, it, in, in the transfer of property to the district, mm -hmm. Barnard retains certain rights in exchange for those rights to doing this maintenance. Yeah. Okay, so that's the background on the story. Mm -hmm. And for the snow removal, we had a contract out this year. It wasn't the town around our exit, but that's a whole different. And that's what I was saying. So and, and that's actually what I tried to clarify is that we we do we don't rely on the towns for that for like actually shoveling on walkways and around. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also don't know the equipment that we can do it ourselves in Barnard. So, yeah, it's all unique to each school. So, I don't think we should get it. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to? Uh, um, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, around the full time employee, would they be year round employee or full time just for the season? And if year, year round, because it's to do groundskeeping as well as snow plowing. So okay, yeah, mowing, what I'm hearing. Sorry, go ahead. Mowing, yeah, it's the mowing and um, the grounds. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I was hoping that we would keep them year round so that Joe may have another hand to support his work across all the campuses. Thank you. All right, negotiations, hiring, and retention committee. That's Bryce and myself. Bryce, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add. Well, I can just say that all the contracts have been signed and sent out um, to both the, to the full staff that received them. And um, uh, there is a plan in place for job descriptions to be updated, hopefully by the end of May, which is at the request of the support staff. Um, any working groups? Uh, yes. Um, so as part of the configuration and enrollment committee, I'm hoping to kind of look at how we delineate our students based on where they live and what school they go to. Like some schools are much bigger, even physically bigger. But um, and I know that when the district merged, um, we have introduced your school choice. But I think the district today looks very different than it did five years ago. And there's a lot more people. Um, so I just kind of want to look at that if anyone's interested in um, digging into that with me. I think like if you know, just looking at the data. Like at Reading, there's seven kids in pre-K, and then Woodstock, there's 65 something kids in pre-K. So I just want to understand how we do it and are we doing that effectively? And you know, just revisit. So just putting that out there if anyone's interested in that. 
Um, so that's part of our articles of agreement. Yeah. So there's a really different structure in terms of how we would change that as right. compared to changing the policy. Yeah. So we would need some yeah. legal consultation. Oh yeah. It's it's a that would be a, that was the rationale for a number of towns joining our merge district. Right. right. But I think a lot of us probably just don't know how that's delineated. Yeah. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of kids in other towns that maybe go to Killington Elementary or go to Woodstock and. It might just be good information to mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm on that committee too, so yeah. I'll look at it with you. And I think yeah. Anna might be interested as well. She's um, still part of that working group. Oh. Yes. The new build uh, met a week ago and had a, had a great um, kind of kickoff meeting. It had been a year since the new build committee had met uh, with the funding passed by the taxpayer in March. Uh, it really gave. Um, Lee, our uh, architect, uh, kind of a mandate to get us on a monthly cadence and come up with some structure around the uh, detailed design activities. Um, as, as if there weren't enough work streams going on, the new build committee is now going to have uh, four kind of um, work streams over the next uh, basically 10 months. There's going to be an education group looking at, you know, the the um, you know the education um, function of the of the new build and, and how well it meets it any changes that need to happen a sustainability group we have Michael Caputo on the working group who uh, chairs sustainable Woodstock so that's one uh, you know, uh, great uh, person to have uh, as part of those efforts looking at the uh, goals of achieving um, net zero ready net zero for that building uh, a construction manager group once the, the CM comes on to um, you know head up those activities and then a communications group as we approach that uh, March 24 uh, bond vote um, to uh, get the word out and to you know, do education sessions in all of our member towns and other community groups. So it was an exciting kickoff to see all those things we've been talking about for you know five or six years starting to kind of you know, get some steam and momentum towards um, you know uh, what's what's coming down the down the road? Great. Any comments, questions? All right. Um, I think the next thing here is the consent agenda, which basically are the minutes from the previous meeting. Um, there's I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you for consenting. Um, is there a second? Okay. okay. Um, all those in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda, please say aye. aye. We have another opportunity for public comment. If there is any member of the public that would like to make a comment and seek the time. Um, Curry, it's Tom Ayers from the Vermont Center, and I just have a simple question. Um, Will there be any public action taken at the conclusion of the executive session? I'm not sure. Okay. I, I you. can't, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's probable, but I can't say for sure. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, I we... wish to speak. I'm oh. not sure. I'm on. Oh, it's okay. Yes. It's Amy Miller. Yes. Am I am I able to speak? Yes, you can speak. You're part of okay. the public. All right. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just want to jog your memory that on February 27th, I addressed the board during your special meeting, the one that focused on transparency, safety, and communication between the administration and parents. At that meeting, I shared my account of the school's lack of response, administration being complicit in their inaction and no investigation of my Title IX report and the blatant re retaliation, discrimination, and complete avoidance or disregard of me, the mom, following that report. Questions and requests made have gone unanswered and unfulfilled. Federally mandated laws have been violated. I requested access to my daughter's federally protected FERPA folder with no response. I've requested an independent review of the sexual assault violation and non-investigation with no response from the school. I submitted an appeal to the Title IX coordinator, the principal, Garen Smale, who didn't, did respond February 4th, stating in writing he will get back to me as soon as possible. 
Since I last spoke to you on February 27th, here is my update. Silence. I've heard nothing back from the school. You are the administration's oversight. And as the governing board, you too are now culpable in this gross negligence and the continued mishandling of my child's safety. Knowledge is responsibility. Take action as if my child is your child and right a horrific wrong that has happened inside your school. Since February 27th, I've again requested an executive session closed meeting due to the sensitive nature of the situation with the board via Carrie Bristow with no response. I've requested updates regarding my acknowledged appeal. These made more than, these requests have been made more than once to both Garen Smale and Sherry Sousa with no response. Superintendent Sherry, tonight you mentioned the HHB policy, procedures and appeal process. Please respond to my requests. Again, per federal Title IX laws, you all are responsible providing, for providing a safe learning environment for our minor children. And ensure policies that you take the time during these meetings to create and approve. Make sure those are actually followed and implemented. Why have them if they're not enforced? Certainly a report of a rape or sexual assault occurring in, the school, in this school is worthy of an investigation. Basic communication to the mom who made the report is expected given the circumstances. And actually communications and updates are expected by the laws and policies that have been created federally. I understand since the February 27th meeting that the bathroom is finally unlocked two years later, yet my daughter has yet to go down that hallway. Board members, please stop silencing me and take a victim of rape seriously. The lack of response is deliberate indifference, making this a liability for the district when federal laws and crimes and safety are not addressed. Thank you again. I plan to be back every month with my updates. Thank you. Amy, what I'm gonna to say to you is that we as a board met, had an executive session to review all of the documents, many of which you're referring to exist. And uh, we were satisfied with the results of that uh, process and we took no further action. So you can come, but we, we're, we have finished with the matter. All right, is there any other public comment? All right, we are going to go into an executive session. I would like us to have a little bit of a break, bathroom, whatever. Do I go into the executive session and then take a break? No, so we'll take a five minute or so break. Um, and then we will go into executive session. How's that? There you go. Okay. Um, I make a motion pursuant to uh, one BSA uh, chapter three thirteen sec section six. Six. Okay. Um, uh, well, my motion is going to be for uh, section seven, oh, which okay. is the academic records of suspension or discipline. Of okay. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Um, there's my motion. Do you have an executive session? Did I say that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. This time it goes. There's both. Well, yes, we, we've all voted. We've just voted to come out of the executive session. Yeah. Don't have the power here. And we, we is, have. Is Tom Iyer still in the way? No. He, <laughs> And we have um, discussed the matter of the student matter, and um, there's no nothing to report.
Will the chair entertain a motion to adjourn? Oh, well, we have to reflect, Bob. Could you give us oh. one reflection? Yeah, let's reflect. <laughs> I appreciate well, y'all hanging hanging tight for four hours. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. One reflection: we could put time limits on presentations. Yeah. yeah. Just mm -hmm. maybe ahead of time, tell them five minutes a piece. I do. I really do. <laughs> I like that <laughs> idea. Yes, Rena. I really did. I said five minutes, please. I just wanted uh, to tell Anne, as our newest board member, that this doesn't happen often. And uh, you know, this, we do have some meetings that will take a couple of hours. I don't know about that. I've heard I've that say this times already. <laughs> this is an hour past my bedtime, so I'm really you're not getting my sharpest thinking here. I'm just I'm just going to push back a little bit and say that certain times it's it's only so often that we get to hear about things like craft so I really appreciate having the longer presentations because it's only a couple times a year that we actually have long presentations that are about academics and other programming usually it's about other other things um so I, I don't mind making I'd rather make the exception for these types of meetings than others can I have been made and seconded are we all in agreement that we can I uh, thank you, everybody, for your patience and your listening.